what, uh, what I want to cover here um, in, in the last bit of time is I want to go back now. We've talked about the pressures and the, and the ways in which these new educational restrictions really serve as a break on the development of the Russian economy, Russian knowledge economy. I want to give you a very good example, a perfect example of the way in which these, and these new educational repressive policies just provide a great deal of collateral damage to Russian technical and scientific development. The example is this fellow, a guy by the name of Mikhail Dolivo Dobrovolsky. He is expelled in 1881 from Riga's Polytechnical Institute for taking part in student protest. He is incapable of getting admission. He, after he's expelled, he can't get readmitted to any of the empire in, empire's institutions of higher education. So what does he do? He leaves Russia. He goes to Germany. And there he completes his training as an electrical engineer at the Darmstadt University of Technology. A decade later, he, he, he comes under the employment of AEG, one of the leading German electrical firms of the age. He's incredibly talented. And he, as, in his work for AEG, he develops the world's first three-phase electrical generator and the first three-phase electrical motor. Why are these important? These are major milestones in the long-distance transmission of electrical currents. As a, result of his, uh, as a result of his inventiveness, a large-scale version of his system is going to be displayed at the World Electrical Engineering Exhibition in Frankfurt in 1891. And what that system does is it transmits electricity from a hydropower plant to the world uh, electrical engineering exhibition from 110 miles away. That is a major breakthrough. Over the course of his inventive career, all of the benefits from his inventive talent, his brilliant mind, are going to be reaped not by the Russian state or Russian companies, but by the German AEG firm. Now, when he, you know, on his deathbed, he donates all of his papers to St. Petersburg University, but big deal. You've got those, but all the profits from his invention go to the Germans. That's, that's the quintessential example here of uh, the way in which these repressive reforms really pull things back. And like I said earlier, Alexander III's reign from 1881 to 1894 is, in many respects, sort of a throwback to the orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality launched under Nicholas I. Conservative ministers under Alexander III want to dampen student unrest by preventing those they considered most susceptible to radical propaganda from enrolling in the first place. And that's Deliana's uh, reforms. He proposes channeling the children, and I'm quoting here, channeling the children of coachmen, cooks, laundresses, small shopkeepers, and similar persons away from universities and into new state-controlled technical institutions designed to meet industry's needs for educated specialists. Now, one of the ironies here is that under Alexander III, this desire for greater technical knowledge is going to lead, as it had done under Nicholas I, to an expansion in technical education. What we would call a polytechnic, like a DeVry Institute, where you go to learn uh, applied technology. That's what the state's going to focus on. That's where it wants members from these lower estates to attend school and leave the universities for what we might call the socially reliable elements. They're really not that socially reliable is what we're going to find out. The state's going to end up uh, sowing the seeds of, of major, major unrest in the process. But in this, in this regard, negotiations are going to be undertaken by the newly appointed finance minister. This is a very important fellow we're going to talk about in more detail later. A fellow by the name of Sergei Vita. He's appointed as finance minister. And he is going to undertake a series of negotiations with leading merchants and industrialists to establish a network of state-run technical vocational institutes. And as a result of his uh, efforts, by the turn of the century, a whole host of new institutions come online, so to speak. There's a new Polytechnic Institute in St. Petersburg. There's a mining academy in Ekaterinoslav. Here are the students at the mining academy um, in 1900. You know, notice once again the uniforms. Uh, there's a new technological institute established in Tomsk. These are going to be all modeled after German institutions. 
which emphasize professional education and research in specialized fields equally. What the polytechnics are designed to do is to align instruction in the industrial sciences with the country's developmental needs as perceived by the state. So none of these are going to emerge as major research centers, but they do help broaden the scientific and technical curricula available in the country. They provide supplemental facilities and periodical publications that expedite the arrival of foreign knowledge. They, their openings are going to lead to an increase of 300% in the number of students attending technical academies between the end of the, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the First World War. And one of the curious things about once these polytechnics emerge, sort of characteristic of the Russian penchant towards hypercentralization, by 1913, the St. Petersburg Polytechnic Institute, established in the late 1890s, is the world's second largest technical institute. Just like that, in, in, in 23 years. It has 5,212 students. You know, not huge by today's standards, but relative at the time, it's the world's second largest polytechnic institute. Again, relative to the empire's population, that's a very small number. Government policies, in fact, do little to alter the shifting social composition of higher education. They also do little to dampen student radicalism. Well, I should say, take it back. The policies dampen student radicalism for about a decade. They're able to suppress it, but they can't eliminate it. It's going to return in force in the 1890s, for reasons I'll explain here in a few minutes. Anti-government sentiment is particularly pronounced in the state polytechnics and in the vocational schools, the so-called practical institutes run by the Russian Technical Society. Why? Because there you have subpar facilities, overcrowded classrooms, and a gnawing sense of social inferiority. The students, remember, Delyanov's idea is to take the sons and daughters of coachmen and laundresses and channel them into the polytechnics, keep them out of the university. Education is underfunded in Russia. The universities get the preponderance of the little funds that are available. What are the conditions like in the polytechnics? They're very poor. And the students there resent their treatment. They know that they're being treated poorly because they're polytechnic students. They know they're in the polytechnic and not the university because they come from less than desirable social backgrounds. This is going to breed resentment and discontent among the students, but also among the faculty. Why? Who teaches at a polytechnic institute? Well, a lot of these folks are going to be political radicals. And a lot of prominent uh, folks who emerge as prominent Marxists and revolutionary leaders in the 19-teens and in 1917 had spent some time as teachers and instructors at polytechnic institutes. This is a serious problem. But here's, here's the, again the dilemma. The government's aware of this. They realize they have what we might call a revolutionary fifth element, teaching in the polytechnic institutes. I mean, even government officials directly concerned with rooting out radicals acknowledge this is a problem. Because if you remove this radical fifth element from the, from the classroom as instructors, who teaches the students? There's no one to teach them. You have to have someone teaching the students the practical skills they need to help industry and development. Absent the radicals, what do you do? It's a serious, serious quandary. There are no politically reliable teachers to replace the radicals if you remove them from the classroom. Herein lies one of the fundamental dilemmas that the Russian state is facing as we move toward now the turn of the 20th century. And this again is that dilemma, that tension between the need to develop an, uh, a knowledge economy in which you have educated, technically adept members of the population growing in numbers. But as you bring more and more people into education, young people into education, you're only inculcating as well uh, their greater realization of the injustices of the system and the extent to which they um, are being mistreated economically. But as you put pressure on them to quash their economic demands, you only end up politicizing their complaints 
leading in time to the generation to the development of a generation of student revolutionary radicals. Now, having said all of this, I, I, I made the statement at the outset that Russia during this same period is going to undergo and experience a, a great deal, a great deal of economic and industrial progress. But the period between 1865 and 1885 is marked by the establishment of an empire-wide banking system, the first significant investment in railways, and a corresponding upsurge in industrial and agricultural production. Relative to uh, the nation's level of development at the outset of the Crimean War, Russia's standing in 1885, 1890 is absolutely fantastic. The results are impressive. But this is the other dilemma. The advances Russia makes between 1865 and 1890, although impressive in the Russian context, are insufficient to keep pace with developments outside of Russia, in Central Europe, in Western Europe, and in the United States. Those countries, those economies, are advancing even more rapidly than Russia's. And they're advancing from the foundation that was ahead of Russia to begin with. Russia is just, it's just no matter what it does, it doesn't quite seem to be able to turn the corner on at least catching up with and then sustaining its parity with the West. The way that it was able to do in the first half of the 19th century, in the, in the, in the long wake of the Petrine reforms. The other problem that Russia faces at this time <coughs> is it faces an additional challenge in the international arena. Russia's principal challenge abroad is the emergence of a newly constituted German Empire that is forged as a united country through a series of victorious wars undertaken by the Prussian army. The chief architect of German unification is the 19th century's, arguably the 19th century's greatest statesman, a fellow by the name of Otto von Bismarck, Iron Chancellor. Bismarck is a staunch conservative. He's drawn from the ranks of the Prussian elite land-owning nobility. And he devises an, a, uh, an innovative program of political pragmatism that he calls Realpolitik. And what this aims to do is to wed military conquest and the unification of the German state into progressive government-sponsored social reform. German historians refer to this as Bismarck's revolution from above. And what it manages to do is it stabilizes the political order and it legitimates the monarchy. Thereafter, Bismarck is going to serve as chancellor of the German Empire, and he is going to help direct a remarkable, if turbulent, period of economic modernization. The Germans are going to reveal are going to realize rapid scientific and technological development. And within about a generation, Germany is going to be transformed into one of the leading industrial and scientific nations in the world. German unification radically alters European and world politics. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. It also profoundly influences the development of technology and science. Germany's re uh, Germany's abundant and readily accessible natural resources, its well-developed water transport systems, its large, well-educated and technically literate populations. Germany has a very advanced knowledge economy. Its deep capital reserves, these now are excellent contexts for industrialization. And as had transpired in Britain earlier, and as was unfolding in the United States at the same time, railway construction in the two decades leading up to 1871 drives industrialization in the German-speaking lands. And after Germany, German's industry has begun to emerge, you see close collaboration between large-scale industries, and in particular, the country's armaments manufacturers. Close collaboration between large-scale industries and the state. This gives rise to what we might call an organized or a cartel capitalism. It's comprised of oligopolies, which aim to achieve mutual economic stability and secure profits through rational, long-term planning of commercial investments. 
In fact, what we would call this is a degree of collusion among major industries. They're going to cooperate with the government on setting prices. They're not going to pursue as much profit as they want. They want regular, stable, sustained profits, more or less underwritten by the state. The state's willing to do this because it's going to provide a more even and complete qualitative development of industry. The industrialists are happy to have this because it means they're going to be getting rich, albeit perhaps not as rapidly as they want, but perhaps without the boom and bust cycles you get, say, in America, where you got a little bit of less of this kind of activity. Under this evolving German, under this evolving German model, German firms make scientific research integral to their corporate activities. They want technological innovation, which they believe is the lifeblood of industrial expansion, to be controlled from within. Now, during this age of synergy from the 1870s to the eve of the First World War, there are two countries. There are two countries that really stand out for their immense success. One is the United States. We've seen that with Thomas Edison, with the Wright brothers, with Sperry and others. We know how much American industry grows rapidly during this period. The other one is Germany. German contributions to, to techno technological innovation, to scientific discovery, easily match and in some cases surpass those of the United Kingdom and the United States. German subjects are going to be responsible for many of the most transformative inventions of this period of human history. Ottmar Mergenthaler's linotype machine, Karl Benz's automobile that you saw earlier, Rudolf Diesel's engine, the discovery and production of x-rays. Do I have my x-rays picture? I didn't. I showed that to you earlier as well. Sorry about that. Uh, x-rays, uh, for which uh, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Röntgen, he receives the world's first Nobel Prize in 1901 for the invention of the x-ray, or the discovery of the x-ray. German industrial manufacturers are going to be or number among the world's leaders in metallurgy, engineering, and construction technologies, electrical generation and distribution, motors, firearms, artillery, precision instrument making, optics. The largest and most powerful of these German firms dominate entire sectors of the national economy. Germany's most sustained and influential contributions, however, are going to come in a relatively new and emerging industry, and that is going to be in the chemical industry. The Air Aspirin Workshop from 1900 is a very good example of this. Appearing in the decade or so prior to German unification, a series of companies like Bayer and others are going to be founded for the purpose of manufacturing dyes and chemical additives used by the textile industry. Their success enables Germany to capture 50% of the world's market for synthetic dyes in 1870. On the eve of World War I, the Germans control roughly 85% of the market for synthetic dyes. The research, and what's more important about this though, is that the researchers who work for German corporate laboratories begin applying their growing knowledge of chemical principles, foundational underlying principles, to making <coughs> possible or making better things like recording tape, photographic film, artificial fibers, explosives. The company's collective efforts are going, to give, are going to give impetus to the rise of organic chemistry as a specialized subfield. So the German chemists are making absolutely gigantic gains. The work undertaken, however, by a chemist named Karl Bosch and a professor, uh, Fritz Haber, in devising what is known as the Haber-Bosch process, what these two individuals develop in the Haber-Bosch process is a means for achieving the industrial synthesis of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. That hardly sounds important. It is of immense importance. This makes possible the development of inexpensive synthetic fertilizers. And it will fuel, in time, the explosive growth of the world's population. It's estimated that today, upwards of 40% of the world's population achieve their caloric intake from agricultural products that are produced using Haber-Bosch or using artificial fertilizer. You don't have this, people are going to die. You can't sustain agricultural production without this. 
The other thing that this does, in establishing the foundations for the pharmaceutical and the chemical industries, you're producing the ammonia and nitrates. You use nitrates in gunpowder as well. And that's one of the curious things about this, these German contributions to world science and technology. They're feeding the world, and at the same time, they're creating new ways of killing people. One of the other things that's going to be, it's going to be the foundation, uh, uh, foundational research that they're going to take is the foundational research into chemical weapons that will be unleashed in the First World War, first against the Russians, then only, sec then only secondarily against the Western Front. Now, given these kinds of monumental achievements, I mean, it's understandable that the Russians are going to be looking here toward the West, toward Germany in the 1890s, and a little bit later toward the United States, and measuring themselves against, against uh, those uh, productive capacities. Editorialists and writers in Russian newspapers are going to routinely take to the pages to critique their nation's failures to live up to foreign standards and alternatively to heap praise on Russian advances, even if they are of only marginal significance. Sometimes they do the exact same thing in a single article. It's what I refer to as compensatory symbolism. Compensatory symbolism. You're looking at the Russian advance, and you're saying, oh, look how fantastically great we are, even if it's not that much of a breakthrough. Public, patriotic contemporaries are going to continue to believe that Russia's lingering backwardness could be quickly overcome. Statesmen and subjects alike are going to point to the precedent of Peter the Great's reign as evidence of the possibilities latent in a distinctively Russian approach to modernization, one that would rapidly transform the nation, transcend the past, and bring about a better future. Convinced that focused leadership and large-scale directed investment would enable the country to bypass earlier stages of development, they aim to adopt advanced technologies and techniques quickly en route to transfiguring Russian, Russia along the lines of Europe's most industrially advanced and impressive states. The government's contribution to promoting technological and scientific progress was more far-reaching and far greater in Russia than anywhere else. Privately, uh, private enterprises, commercial banks, corporations, and other capital institutions play roles in Russian development. They play roles in Russian modernization. But it is the state and its ministers that are going to provide the principal impetus for the country's takeoff in the decades leading up to the First World War. Particularly important in this regard uh, was the need to establish Russia's credit markets. I've talked all semester long about surplus scarcity as being one of the defining characteristics of Russian historical development. You need capital for investment. In the absence of capital for investment, development stagnates. And one of the key challenges that Russia faces in the 1880s and the 1890s is all of these new technological and scientific systems are being developed in the West. These are immensely expensive. Why is it that, uh, that Thomas Alva Edison when he performs his first public display of his electrical illumination system, why does he illuminate parts of Wall Street in New York? Because that, that's exactly right. That's where the potential investors are. He's trying to raise money. It's not enough just to have the invention. It's not enough to have the idea. It's not enough to invent the pro or to build the prototype. You now need massive amounts of capital to transform that prototype into a production line. What is it that the Russian state needs in addition to a knowledge economy, in addition to innovation? It needs, once again, capital. It's got to have money for investment. What the state will end up doing in the late 1880s and the 1890s, under the direction of the finance ministry, it will begin a long and protracted effort to raise the state's credit worthiness and to improve the climate for international business and trade with Russian enterprises. One of the problems the Russians had faced throughout the 19th century is that the value of Russian currency fluctuated significantly. If you're a foreign investor, is this an environment in which you want to put your money? Probably not. You don't know what the value of the Russian currency is 
If the value of the currency is high and you invest in Russian enterprises and all of a sudden the currency value collapses on the international market, you're going to lose a fortune. So the state is very, very interested, the finance ministry is very, very interested in creating a stable currency environment. Because one of the things that promotes inventiveness and entrepreneurial activity, business activity in general, stability. Businessmen and women, entrepreneurs do not like instability because there's so much else in a startup business that is uncertain. You want to know at least that the economy is going to be solid, that there are rules and regulations in place that will remain in place and will not be altered arbitrarily. You want stability. So the state is going to work here to bring stability to the currency markets. From the mid-1880s on, a series of finance ministers are going to undertake the painstaking process of accumulating gold <coughs> reserves. You want to accumulate, the goal is to accumulate enough gold reserves that you can move the Russian ruble onto the gold standard. The gold standard at the time, this was the way in which um, you determine the value. It's, it's the international denominator of value. Moving Russia onto the gold standard is not easy. Surplus scarcity is a major obstacle, all the more so in light of the incredible costs of the state's ambitions. To procure the capital prerequisite to accumulating a specie or gold, gold reserves, the government renegotiates its cons renegotiated its considerable foreign debts. And it sought new domestic revenues by raising onerous indirect taxes that are levied on daily essentials. The state will begin taxing absolute daily essentials like kerosene, sugar, and above all, vodka. <laughs> I'm not kidding. The state's got a monopoly on this. We'll talk about that later as well. It also aims to expand its income to the export of raw materials and commodities. The most important export, the most important commodity export Russia has at this point, grain. It's going to export grain growing in Ukraine out onto the world market. Bumper crops, in, or bumper harvest in 1887 and 1888 helped significantly. But as you know, going all the way back to the beginning of class, Central Russia's climate is notoriously fickle. And it delivers early frosts in the autumn of 1890, followed by a brutally harsh winter, springtime floods, and then a protracted drought. By midsummer of 1891, hunger looms on an incredible scale in central Russia. There are 17 provinces directly affected by the failed harvest, and they cover an area larger than the state of France stretching from the, uh, the Black Sea to the Ural Mountains. It's a little bit difficult to see here on this map that's washed out. But the darker areas here on <coughs> Kherson province, but especially here just to the east of Kharkov, all the way up almost to the city of Perm. This is the famine region, well, I should say the, uh, the, 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 the region most directly affected by the failure of the harvest. It's an area equal, it's an area actually, it's almost double the size of France. It is home to upward of 36 million people in 1891. Nearly one third of those people were receiving some form of government aid before the bad harvest. The supply crisis begins to unfold in the latter half of 1891 and the government simply refuses to acknowledge reality. State censors prohibit newspapers from reporting on famine, instead demanding that they use the euphemism, poor harvest. Worse yet, the Minister of Finance, a fellow by the name of Ivan Vishnogradsky, refuses to postpone the delivery of grain to European markets. He proclaims, and I quote, even if we starve, we will export grain. And they did start, the peasants anyway. By the time the famine of 1891-1892 had run its course, as many as 500,000 people had died of starvation. 
The onset of this tragedy is going to widely be attributed to the government's indifference to the fate of its poorest subjects and its insistence on accumulating gold reserves at any cost. Once the government finally comes around to ad admitting what had happened, state agents immediately found themselves overwhelmed. The government was simply unable to cope with the magnitude of the crisis. The Tsar, Alexander III, is going to issue an emergency decree in November, calling upon the public to form organizations to aid famine victims. The response is immediate and it's impressive. Newspapers and periodicals uh, print appeals for donations. Local Zemstva officials distribute medicine and food. Doctors volunteer to serve on medical teams. Thousands of ordinary subjects are going to give their time and money in relief campaigns organized by the Free Economic Society and other voluntary associations. This is a major moment in Imperial Russian history. The autocracy's culpability in abetting the famine, its bumbling response to the crisis, thoroughly discredits the autocracy in the eyes of public society. The famine and the ensuing release agent, the ensuing relief agent, uh, efforts, excuse me, are going to be critical uh, moments in strengthening the bonds of civil society. What the state has said is we can't cope with this. It turns the newspaper, it turns the voluntary association, it turns the Zemsis for help. All of a sudden now, the state, it's, it's not that society is dependent upon the state, the state is dependent upon society. And this is going to give rise now to a great groundswell of obsessiveness, sense of civic consciousness and civic duty. Once the crisis is passed, public distrust of the autocracy remains. The government faces growing pressure to allow representatives of the nation's Zemstas, professional organizations, business communities, and other civic groups to assume greater responsibility in managing the country's affairs. The other thing that the, 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 the crisis of the famine engenders is it revives the ranks of revolutionary agitators who had been largely dormant in the 1880s. They are going to return now to action in the decades of the 1890s, fed by a persistent under, and they're going to feed a persistent undercurrent of violence and terror that will bedevil the state and society until the autocracies collapse in 1917. Many of the most vocal agitators are going to come from the campuses of universities and polytechnic institutes. They're angered already by the repressive treatment on the part of the state. They are driven here into, in, into political rage in the aftermath of the famine. All the same, Despite the immense uh, human costs, the government stays the course in its fiscal and monetary policy. By January of 1897, the government has accrued sufficient reserves to place Russia on the gold standard. And thereafter, the state bank becomes the fulcrum for commercial and, indu and industrial life. The finance ministry is engaged in a delicate balancing act between promoting international commerce and business while protecting nascent domestic industries trying to build a stronger, more efficient, better capitalized economy. The individual who is associated most with this period in Russian industrial and economic development is this fellow Sergei Vita. Remember, he is the minister. He is the minister who was behind the expansion of polytechnic education in the late 1880s. He's a very forward-looking state minister. He's one of those new technocrats after the fashion of Melnikov, uh, Pavel Melnikov, the, uh, the railroad engineer of the 1840s and 1850s, is sort of the prototypical example. Vita is an example now of the real technocratic element that has uh, uh, attached itself or developed within the Russian autocracy. His biographer has referred to him as a pragmatic, vic uh, a pragmatic visionary. He had begun his career as a railroad engineer, and he would rise, his, rise through the state bureaucratic ranks to serve as finance minister between 1892 and 1893. He, he personifies the consensus among technocratic state agents that what Russia needed was a Western-styled commercial industrial economy that would secure its prosperity and its geopolitical situation. But here's the irony. Vita, forward-looking, progressive in his economic and industrial views, remained a staunch defender of autocratic absolutism. He wanted to build Russia's technical, scientific, and industrial capacities without infringing upon the prerogatives of the Tsar. 
He did not want to undermine traditional social political orders upon which the autocracy was based. His model was effectively Germany. Germany's brilliant and unprecedented success in technology and production, he would write, in commerce and in the development of communications, these represented the path that Russia should take. The German state, the new German state under Bismarck, had brought together an absolutist bureaucratic political tradition and industrial modernity. Witte thinks this is the way out for Russia. Well aware, I mean, again, he's risen through the ranks of, of, of the railroad. It's not surprisingly, it's not surprising then that he's going to be convinced that transportation and communication technologies are key to overcoming the impediments that Russia faces. Most important in this regard was the railroad, which he regarded, quote, as one of the chief instruments of progress in our time. Vita is convinced that intensive development of the railroad would strengthen the imperial economy, would hasten market development, would facilitate the importation of advanced technologies and techniques, it would lower transportation costs, and it would spur ancillary sectors of the economy, like iron and coal production, steel manufacturing, and the machine tools industry. At the same time, he was convinced that expanded railway networks would advance the autocracy's civilizing mission by binding together the empire's far-flung lands, making communication and relations from Moscow all the way out into Siberia and the Far East far more readily available. <coughs> he develops a detailed plan for railroad construction, and he begins overseeing this once he becomes finance minister. His goal is to give priority to the country's economic interest, to the development of its productive forces, and the proper pace of its commerce. And what happens under, under Vita's tenure as railway minister, or under, under Vita's tenure as uh, finance minister, is that Russia's railway production now is going to expand by leaps and bounds. Between 1890 and 1901, the empire's network of rail doubles, increasing from 19,000 uh, to over uh, 35,000. The final four years before the turn of the century sees an average 1,750 miles of new track open annually. That's more than double the rate recorded during the country's uh, initial railroad surge. The government sustains this construction boom with state funds, guaranteed loans and subsidies. It spends over three and a half billion rubles over the decade. It spends nearly one-fourth of the entire uh, net investment from the state, one-fourth of it goes into railways. The Russian network expands dramatically. No, I'll get back to that in a second. Sorry about that. By 1900, Russia possesses the world's second largest railroad network. There's another example of a great Russian accomplishment. The world's second largest railroad network by 1900, it trails only the United States in terms of the, of the amount of miles of rail that it is laying, but there's a problem. Russia is a great deal larger. It's a great deal larger. So that even though it has undertaken this immense investment campaign, it has expanded its rail capacity, the railway network is still inadequate and stretched thin. The most ambitious project that's going to be undertaken under Vita's tenure is the construction of the, four, of the close to 4,000 mile long Trans-Siberian Railway. It's launched in 1891 uh, when he was still Minister of, of Transportation. It opens officially in 1904. This may have been the most expensive peacetime undertaking in modern history up to this time. It was comparable to earlier state-sponsored mega-projects that we've seen. Like the, complex, like the construction of the Kremlin complex under Ivan III, the construction of St. Petersburg by Peter the Great. It's a precursor to some of the, the, the monstrous Soviet colossalist construction projects that you get in the 1930s. The Trans-Siberian Railway aimed to, aimed to resolve a whole host of issues in a single transcendent act. Its goal was to stimulate industrial growth through the construction of key raw materials, or through the consumption of key raw materials, to open Siberia to colonization, to spur economic growth, to shore up the autocracy's geopolitical situation. The project was embodied also by important symbolic 
elements. Witte believed that the, the completion of the Trans-Siberian Railway would augment the authority and the standing of the autocracy because it would demonstrate the state's capacity to meet the challenges of modernization through the mobilization of resources in the accomplishment of a truly historic and great engineering deed. Is that what happened? This is Russia. No, not exactly. Siberia's vast remote regions and severe climate presented unending challenges to Russian engineers. Inadequate resources imposed terrible hardship on the peasants and prison laborers who worked in the isolated taiga, although overall death rates were kept to a respectable 2%. At the time, at the time, that's, that's pretty reasonable. Inexperienced managers, inadequate accounting procedures led to widespread corruption. Cost overruns exceeded 150% of original estimates. Design flaws and material deficiencies ensured that many miles of track um, had to be replaced almost as soon as they were laid down. Bridges were built initially using wood rather than iron to save on costs. What happens to the wood in that harsh Siberian environment? It deteriorates within a few seasons. You've got to rebuild the things. Far from a testament to the autocratic state's engineering prowess, the Trans-Siberian Railway was in the words of its American historian, a monument of bungling. There are many, many pro problems associated with this mega project, but it does have the positive impact of spurring development of other industries. It stimulates industrial growth. Coal production expands. Uh, iron ore output expands. Uh, oil production expands. In fact, uh, at, the turn of the at the turn of the 20th century, Russia is the world's largest oil producer. Not, not for a long, just briefly it is. But it's the world's largest oil producer. The oil is located in uh, the, uh, the areas in and around the Caspian Sea, near the city of Baku. I'll talk more about this after the break. We'll talk about this the next time uh, we meet, about how important the oil industry is, and some of the innovative things the Russians do with oil that you haven't thought about, you don't know. Another way in which the Russians are contributing here to the age of synergy. In, the, in, in largely unknown ways. Rather, however, than recasting the empire's economic base, this rapid growth only reinforced existing structural patterns, most notably the extreme geographic concentration of Russian industries. Mining operations established in the 1870s are concentrated in Ukraine's Donbas region. That's what we had talked about earlier. That's where they're gonna do most of the mining. Um, in, in, uh, in 1900, in 1900, 70 percent of all Russian coal is produced in the Donbass. That's, that's a highly concentrated industry. That's where you're going to go for most of your coal. Another example uh, would be textiles, which is focused in Moscow. Heavy industry is located in St. Petersburg. Petroleum, I've already mentioned, uh, in, the, in the Caucasus around Baku. So there's a trend towards uh, uh, the concentration of industries, geographic concentration. There's also a trend toward concentrating industrial production in very large enterprises. This is one of the things that's kind of characteristic of Russia, much more so than in Germany or the United States. You still have many small artisanal manufacturers, but by 1890, 40%, 40 percent of the empire's factory workers labor in enterprises that employ more than a thousand people. Let's think about that for a second. What's going on in the United States in the 1880s and 1890s in urban settings regarding industrial labor? It's huge factories with lots and lots and lots of people that then and they're going on strike. There's a great deal of labor unrest. The Russian industrial enterprises are even more concentrated in St. Petersburg, the capital of the country, Moscow, its second largest city. They're concentrated there, textiles, heavy industry, textiles in the Moscow case, heavy industry in the St. Petersburg case, armaments as well in the St. Petersburg case. So you've got those industries centered in those cities, and within those cities, the manufacturers tend to be of very large size 
meaning you have a very large number of workers working in close proximity, so that in the event you have labor unrest, you've created perfect breeding grounds for explosive labor violence because of the high concentration of these industries in major cities. You're not, you're not getting a lot of industrial production in Washington, D.C. You know, the, the labor unrest of Chicago, New York, as opposed to Washington, D.C. When it breaks out in Russia, it's going to be St. Petersburg, Moscow. Because of that centralizing tendency, you're going to end up centralizing as well then the revolutionary unrest. It wasn't intentional, but it's going to be of immense historic importance. Across the board growth in the quantity and scale of industrial output <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was not matched by uniform advances necessarily in efficiency. There is still an oversupply of low-paid, low-skilled workers. This is going to prove an impediment to investment in labor-saving machinery and methods. High protective tariffs guarantee markets, but they reduce the need for cutting costs by adopting cutting-edge techniques and technologies. Sometimes state uh, subsidies could underwrite modernization of private firms, but the additional burdens that you accept if you accept the government money, just like Mendeleev with his research laboratory, the burdens of accepting all the government restrictions and oversight oftentimes aren't worth it. When technological uh, development takes place, it does so in almost every instance as a result of the arrival, once again, of foreign entrepreneurs. Western firms are going to be responsible for the preponderance of the financial material and intellectual resources that sustain Russian development during the age of synergy. Direct and indirect investment by foreigners accounted for fully one half of all capital resources developed in the empire's industrial modernization spurt in the 25 years before World War I. Advanced machine tools and components, blueprints, manufacturing processes, technical advice, other kinds of assistance are going to come from licensing agreements with existing imperial enterprises or after, 19, after 1890 through the creation of subsidiary companies in Russia, the Western subsidiaries that are designed to avoid tariffs imposed by the state. By the turn of the 20th century, Russia had turned the corner en route to becoming a technologically advanced commercial industrial power. In most respects, the process by which the country's development had unfolded during this period was similar to that of the past. The state and its agents remained at the center of technical and scientific modernization. They charted the course and they mobilized resources for the purpose of rapidly catching up to Western Europe and the United States. Characteristically, their approaches emphasize geopolitical considerations and military concerns. That's the emphasis on transportation and communication networks, extractive and heavy industries rather than focusing on consumer needs. Once again, foreign experts will provide the necessary technical tools, training, and expertise, and the bulk of capital. They also supply much of the entrepreneurial energy required to sustain and maintain increasingly expensive and complex systems. And as always, as always, the price of state aspirations will be borne by the empire's peasants. They pay with onerous taxes, physical exploitation, and occasionally, as in 1891-1892, they pay with their lives. Now, having said all of this, that these historical continuities notwithstanding, Russia's belated but now increasingly rapid development is going to be marked by significant changes. Chief among these is the emergence of a modern knowledge economy comprised of educational establishments, voluntary associations, professionals, and specialists. These individuals are both the products and the beneficiaries of government efforts to promote a native culture of innovation. These new institutions and individuals are going to be instrumental to advancing technical and scientific progress. At the same time, they serve as building blocks for the construction of civic society. Greater openness, access to information is going to equip them to match the accomplishments of their international peers. It will also, however, encourage them to assert their rights their rights to share collectively in determining the course of the nation. Distinct from the social estates and political hierarchies that had long structured the imperial order, they are going to pose a fundamental, if still emergent, threat to the ideology of absolutism. It is their growing disaffection 
the growing disaffection of, of professionals, of lawyers, of journalists, of doctors, of teachers, of university students, of students enrolled in polytechnic institutes, their growing dissatisfaction, their increasing disillusionment with the government, especially in the wake of the 1891-92 famine, this will prefigure the revolutionary unrest that is going to sweep across the empire in the opening years of the 20th century.